Welcome to 700 Club Canada. Today we're going to be talking about joy. Now, Bill, what brings you joy in your life? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's actually joy in the morning. And as soon as I saw the theme, I thought of my wife because literally, I'm not exaggerating and I'm not just saying this because she's watching. It's true. She is one of the happiest people on the planet. And every morning she wakes up joyful and it's, it's impossible to be miserable when you're around people who are just happy <laughs> even in the morning before coffee. It's amazing. It's, it's supernatural, I yeah. think. Well, well, actually, that's so true. It's contagious, right? And yes. there's an article, uh, ABC News put this article out that it, does how when we smile, it actually gives chemicals in our brain that makes us feel better. So smile not only for others, but for yourself. Smile under those masks, right? Yeah. Well, I think we should all just smile right now at each other. Just smile and let release those endorphins. <laughs> I think that's a great, great idea. That's right. Well, we're so glad that you are here. And next, Cheryl Nimhart is going to talk to us about the Harriet Tubman story. Well, welcome back to the show, Cheryl Nemhard. Yeah, it's so good to be back. Yeah. This, I'm telling you, it feels like home. Love it. Well, I'll tell you, you kicked off this month, and you're just going to be wrapping up this month with us. Not that it comes to an end, but you know what? Nothing better than chatting with my friend Cheryl. There's many great Canadian heroes that teach us, even today, how to respond to injustice. Right, Cheryl? And I want you to tell us the Harriet Tubman's story and her strong connection to Canada and just some lessons that we can learn from her life. Mm. Well, Harriet Tubman, uh, I tell you, she is one of my sheroes for sure. She's a, a well-known American abolitionist, uh, and she was the famous conductor of the Underground Railroad. Um, this is a woman who boldly left her plantation uh, in fear and the dread of night and made a decision once she reached Fair Shores that she would not just think of herself, and this is the part that really gets me emotional, but she would risk her life over and over and over mm -hmm. to bring others to freedom. Uh, wow. She also plays a very important role in our history here in Canada, and there's this beautiful sort of marriage of the two stories, as many of the Underground Railroad stations were here in Canada, and in fact, to all slaves who were running for freedom, Canada was referred to as the Promised Land. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. sung about it. They spoke about it. And when they referred to the promised land, they were referring to Canada. Uh, Harriet Tubman's home base, in fact, is in St. Catharines, where she lived from 1851 to 1861. And she traveled back and forth. Uh, but she always felt compelled to do the work of God in liberating uh, African-Americans out of slavery. She made that trip to Canada, Lori, actually over 19 times. Uh, mm -hmm. And you'd have to understand each time uh, the potential is there of being uh, mm -hmm. captured, tortured, death, uh, and she rescued anywhere from three to 500 slaves. Oh, um, I, I draw some lessons from her life, I think, that we all can today, which is one of the things that hits me really hard is, is to be willing to do the brave thing that God mm -hmm. calls you to do and know that he is with you in it that he will protect you and provide for you and be your harbor and your safety and all of it. And then the last is uh, when faced with injustice, it is a time to not shrink back, but to step forward, to speak up and to be brave. Oh man, that is it. I, I just love her story too, Cheryl. I think recently there was a movie that was released that really depicted it well. And like you said, don't shrink back. Like, what an example to us. She literally was willing to lay down her life. I mean, this is this is the gospel message, right? Like, she really lived it out. And, you know, there's so many other heroes we could talk about, but tell us about non-Black Canadians, you know, of faith. Like, what role did they play in the Underground Railroad? I, I love this question, Laurie, because uh, my, my theater group actually has the privilege of uh, tributizing her. We have a, a play called Araminta, which is actually Harriet's birth name. Uh, she took on Harriet to honor her mother. And so uh, the story of Araminta 
uh, really highlights the Canadian narrative, the piece that we uh, don't dwell in a lot. And, and it highlights some non-Black uh, allies who risked their life as well, um, uh, risked isolation and being ostracized from community. They were uh, moved by faith. They were Quakers and felt that slavery in their heart of hearts was immoral. Uh, two people I'd love to highlight for you. One is William King. Uh, he was an Irish-born minister and an abolitionist. He founded the Elgin Settlement, which we know today. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a, it was a community of former African-American slaves in southwest in Ontario, and it's a great place to visit if anyone's ever thinking of taking a road trip. Uh, and this one I love the most is Jane Walls. She's actually a character in my play. Uh, she is a brave woman who had a safe house uh, that people would come with a secret knock. Uh, they'd get a, a, a sort of their plans through stations to get there. She literally rescued, documented over 500 slaves. Uh, she wow. gave them food, shelter, a place to hide. Uh, her and her husband, John Walls, and uh, you can see their shack today. Um, they they were involved uh, very deeply during the time of the Fugitive Slave Law, which was a law that said that even if a slave had found freedom, built a home, a new life, that if there was a bounty hunter, which were always coming into Canada looking for slaves, that they could literally grab them and bring them back. And so we've seen that in the movie 12 Years a Slave. That there's a good example for those that are wondering what that looks like, where someone could be free and captured and brought back into captivity. So the walls were instrumental in helping uh, those who were settling uh, continue to stay safe and to find safe harbor. They had a 12-acre property uh, in Elgin, and it was called the Refugee Home Society. Just so you know. That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, you look through history where people are, you know, I mean, there's so many different examples of the evil of injustice and racism, and we need allies. There's always the hero of allies in the story that, that come alongside and take up the cause, right? on behalf of those who are in need of help. And I think that's a real word for us today. Uh, do you want to speak to that, what, what it means to be an ally today? Yeah, it's it's funny because it, it really is, um, I feel the charge for us as believers, but more importantly for the Church of Canada. I feel mm -hmm. that it is our time to be better allies than we have ever been in this history's time. It is time for us to step into authentic allyship, not performative. And I've done a little breakdown of allyship real quick, just to help okay. people understand what um, the BIPOC community is looking for, people of color. We're looking for uh, allies to acknowledge racism and white supremacy wherever and wh whenever and wherever they see it. And acknowledging means to address doesn't mean to just look and observe and walk away, but to acknowledge it, to address it, to call it out. Uh, yeah, the yeah. L and L is uh, to be in a posture of listening and learning. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that we can educate ourselves, that we can uh, find empathy, compassion, understand the stories and the narratives that are being told. We need to be in a posture of listening and learning. Mm -hmm. I think once you do that, the why is easy. We're asking that believers and churches yield space to, to mm -hmm. BIPOC voices, allow the Indigenous, allow those of color to speak, to share their story, uh, to share their hopes and dreams that we can partner and come together and allow those voices that are gifted, brilliant, skilled, just like everyone else's to be amplified uh, in this season. The S is to stand alongside, but it also has a double meaning, which is I want to share. To be an ally, you have to be willing to put skin in the game. Mm -hmm. And that means that sometimes allyship costs something, Lori, and it could be discomfort, mm -hmm could be losing a friend. It could be uh, challenging a family member. It could be being the one uh, that, that does the awkward thing of saying, that's not an appropriate joke and I'm not comfortable. And so being an ally means that we're willing to pay the cost of, of standing for truth and righteousness. Um, and so, yeah, H, we want to help. We want to ask you to help us move the needle forward in this movement of, of anti-racism by not just uh, being affected by what's going on and saying, oh, that's so bad, 
but actually being an active person uh, who is anti-racist. That's the big word. Mm -hmm. So you are looking to shut down, to, 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 to um, you know, denounce, to stop, to block racism. It's a different posture. It's very active. It's very intentional. Yeah. And uh, I can't remember. Oh, I most importantly, <laughs> believers, we need we need to pray. Yeah, we yeah. need to pray intercession. I am a woman that believes that prayer changes this nation. Yes, and we yeah, need man, to amen. cry out to yeah, our yeah. God, who is the one who can help us. And we need to pray yeah, for the yeah. church, that yeah, they will have yeah. wisdom to know what to do, the bravery to say what they need to say, yeah, and the boldness yeah. to walk in that truth and that yeah. justice. And then the last uh, P, when you've made a decision to uh, be an advocate, to be an ally, we're asking that that allyship not be performative. What do I mean by that? I mean that we're not following trends, we're not doing something for optics sake because the messaging looks good or it's good for our brand, but there's a real change of heart that has happened and we are walking that out. I really yeah. believe that social justice, as Cornell West said, is it's 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 what love looks like in public. So good, Cheryl. Well, thank you for that, for giving us sort of handles to walk through what it looks like. And I thank you for your example, for your ability to teach and educate for more the more importantly, the life that you live. And, uh, you know, this is a real time in our nation. And this month of uh, Black History Month has been a wonderful time of relearning and learning and engaging and stepping into more active ways to be allies. Thank you, Cheryl, bless you and all you do. Thank you. And, and just thank you for all the work that you guys are doing as well. Okay. I just knew life had stopped for us. And I remember looking out the UK window and there was a football game and people were going and I said, these people's lives are just going on. They're laughing and talking and we're in this room and our lives have stopped. It was homecoming weekend for Bath County High School in Kentucky. On the way to the dance, 16 year old Aaron Williams lost control of his car and slammed into a tree. Aaron sustained massive head trauma and was unconscious as the car burst into flames. Brock Baber drove by the scene just moments after the accident. There was uh, a man carrying what looked, to, what looked to be a body and he was bringing it up towards his tailgate of his truck. It was very traumatic. Uh, they were just kind of in shock and at a loss of what to do and something just came over me and said, guys, I'm gonna pray. Brock's prayer was the first of thousands for Aaron. Homecoming was canceled and students gathered at a local church to pray. His parents, Chris and Veronica, rushed to the UK hospital, uncertain of Aaron's condition. I couldn't get there fast enough. I, I needed to see him, I needed to see what he looked like, I needed to, I needed to be there. I stopped at that curb, kneeled down, and asked God to save my son. Aaron was in a coma with traumatic brain injury and on life support. A doctor told Chris the prognosis. And he said, your son won't live through the night. He had a disfusion, accidental brain injury. In layman's terms, they told me, his brain has been decapitated from his body and all the neurons are just spinning in his head. According to the doctor, 90% of people with his injury do not survive. The remaining 10% live with permanent mental or physical disabilities. Over the next few days, classmates and the community came to pray for Aaron in the trauma unit. You can't go back there unless the nurses light you. But they let all 200 people come in and see him. And then we asked her at one time, why? And she said, because they didn't expect him to make it. He clung to life as prayer gatherings and encouraging emails came in from around the world. Chris and Veronica put their faith in God for a miracle, despite the prognosis. Every time a doctor would tell us something what they knew, professionally knew, my wife and I would look at each other and say, let's trust God. Let's just keep trusting God. No matter what they just told us, let's trust God. Five days after the accident, Chris and Veronica feared they would be asked to remove Aaron from life support. That night, Veronica says she fought for Aaron's life in prayer. I laid, I opened up the Bible. I read those scriptures. I prayed. 
I read out of the Bible and I prayed and I went all the way around his bed. And I did this for two solid hours. And I knew at that moment, I knew God was in control. Everything that was happening, God was in it. And I knew it was gonna be okay. I knew it. 12 hours later, Aaron suddenly showed signs of brain activity. They would pinch him, they would take his skin and they would pinch him and they would scream in his ear, trying to get any kind of movement, any kind of response, there was nothing. She grabbed that broken collarbone and pressed on it as hard as she could press. She said, Aaron, you've been in a car wreck. I need for you to give me a thumbs up. And just in the nick of time, that day, nothing before, but Aaron gave a thumbs up. He was transferred to a rehab hospital, but remained in a vegetative state coma. Then 43 days after the accident, a friend noticed something different about Aaron. He said, he's trying to talk to us. And I said, what do you mean? He said, he's trying to tell us something. He said, do you have an iPad? So we opened it up and got it started and they put it in his hands and he instantly, he opened it up on the notes and started texting, what's wrong with me? How long have I been here? Why can't I talk? Why can't I walk? He had so many questions. It went on for an hour. And that day was wonderful because that was the day we knew he was there. Against all odds, Aaron was back. He had to learn to speak and walk again, but was soon fully functional and thankful for the prayers that sustained him. Whenever I first woke up, I thought it was just a regular car wreck, regular old car wreck. I wasn't, I didn't know all the details yet. So I was like, isn't there a lot of people that get in car wrecks and they don't have prayer groups like this? And, I was just amazed. I'm thankful to have all everybody around me that supports me, helps me through everything that I go through. I believe and pay tribute to an almighty God who heard the prayers of thousands of people. There is power in prayer. What the doctors have told us, what he has come through, you have to believe that it's a miracle. There's no doubt. Aaron returned to school and graduated in 2018. He's attending college in Kentucky and pursuing an engineering degree. Chris and Veronica are thankful for all the prayers and the presence of God when they needed him most. When you have a crisis in your life, you need him. And you've got to be ready, you've got to be prayed up, because if I wasn't, I, I wouldn't have been in the situation where I could have done that for my son. I couldn't have prayed for him. And I know that's the only thing that has helped him. Aaron is, is, is proof in God and hope. Even though I was told there was no hope, there's always hope of Jesus. Always hope of Jesus. So what do you do when the prognosis is desperate? I, I love that last story because really the answer should always be, the first thing should always be prayer. And you may ask why, why should prayer be the first thing when I'm desperate? Well, I'll tell you why. First, it directs your focus to the only one who can solve the problem anyway. It focuses is your attention upwards to the God who is the great healer and restorer. Second, I've learned that prayer actually softens your heart. Sometimes life can harden you and you become really bitter or resentful. Um, and so prayer is a way of God softening your heart and tilling the soil so he can do something new in you. And then finally, prayer preps us for our testimony. And I've just learned, I know it's a bit cliche, but you can't have a testimony without a test. And so here's why I wanna encourage you, whatever you're going through, when it gets desperate, to pray first. Why? because it turns your focus upward to the God who can solve your problem. It softens your heart so God can do something new. And it tells an amazing story to those around you of a God who is great, even when life isn't. Now, up next, we're gonna learn how music healed a woman's sickness and turned it into a calling. Who is this girl trying to be? Who in the world is she trying to please? Suddenly ignited by a spark. I hear my Savior's voice speaking right to my heart. Don't give up now and don't be afraid. You know who you are and you got something to say. And those memories 
I wanted to be everything growing up. I just had 85 million dreams every five minutes. When I got sick, I just kind of stopped dreaming about everything. Nothing was really that important to me, honestly, because I just felt like it was useless to dream. It started off with just like a simple like arm gestures and like leg gestures. And then um, after even more weeks passed, I started to do this like head twitch thing like that and squeeze my eyes like that and keep them shut for four or five seconds. And I wanted to try to restrain my body. I realized it was a problem when I couldn't fix it. I was 11 years old, an appointment with my neurologist. They told me I have Tourette syndrome. It's a neurological meaning brain condition that causes movements and sounds um, called tics that are uncontrollable or involuntary. Went into my own world because I, I hated what I was hearing. Um, I hated hearing the words incurable. Um, I hated hearing the words, you know, treatment and tests and trying medicines. That phrase freaked me out. Tourette syndrome is not a life-threatening condition by any means, but it's very much a life-altering condition. The tics in themselves were getting increasingly worse. I had an issue with always punching things, um, a lot of times just hitting my knuckles together. My legs would consistently twitch every three or four steps, and so um, I just found myself sitting down all the time. I was also diagnosed later with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, anxiety. I was trying so many different medicines just to make it work, you know, just to be able to wake up in the morning or just to be able to fall asleep at night or just to be able to get through the day. I was having a hard time with it. You know, I felt like I had been serving Jesus my entire life in church, and yet I prayed and said, God, will you fix me? And he wouldn't do it. I mean, I felt like it was something personal almost. I was just like, seriously, Jesus, I don't know if you're like looking over me, like I don't know what's going on, but I'm facing some big stuff here and I'm gonna need you to fix it like now. Um, and I was just getting really frustrated and I just went through this period of my life where I just, I started to doubt him. My granddaddy, my mom's dad, I think he just saw that we were just kind of going through so much and just facing just so many troubles. He just wanted to bring joy. He brought a drum set, he brought a guitar and an amplifier, and he was like, let's go. And the first song we ever learned how to play was Amazing Love. It sounded awful, but I remember sitting there playing Amazing Love, How Could It Be That You, My King, Would Die For Me, when I barely believed those lyrics myself. I learned how to play those drums, and I was like, this is incredible. Like, physically, it felt amazing. I mean, I connected with music in a way that that was just, I had never connected with anything before. But also I realized early on that when I really got in the zone, when I really started to play, that I didn't twitch. And I loved that. Um, I felt free. I was 13, 14 years old, and I was realizing that I love to play instruments and I love to share music with other people. And I also was realizing that God was showing me that even though life is hard, life isn't over. I remember just kind of waking up one morning and realizing that those two things went together. Like, maybe I could encourage somebody else. Like, I just, this whole, like, kind of concept of encouraging other people became my new favorite thing. I was like, I'm gonna go to YouTube. Like, I'm, I gotta tell people on YouTube. And I always say, like, when you serve a big God, it's hard to be surprised when he does big stuff. But at the same time, I was very surprised. <laughs> and I was 18 or 19 when I got a message on the Twitter that just said, you know, hey, I'd love to talk to you about some music sometime. Your music's great. Signed, Toby Mac. They offered me a deal with GoTo Records. That's kind of how it all started from there. Literally, two weeks later, we were in the studio recording Hold Me. I do still have Tourette Syndrome, but it's... It's a challenge, but it's not as severe as it was when I was a kid. I might go through even more difficult things as I get older. I just have to focus on the, th the things that the Lord has given me. And my favorite Bible verse, I mean, just is Psalms 30, verse 5, and it says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And that is just kind of a reminder to me that we're going to cry, we're going to weep, and it may last a whole night. It may last a whole month. Sometimes a year. That morning may last a little bit longer, but... God's never failing joy, it's never ending joy, it will always come in the morning.
is well. He founded a global ministry, interviewed world leaders, was a leading presidential candidate, and he has walked with the living God. In Pat Robertson's latest book, discover the principles that guided this extraordinary life and how they can shape your future. When you become a 700 Club Canada partner, we'll send you your copy of I Have Walked with the Living God. Call now. Well, Bill, this show really did bring uh, to mind that we can have joy in the morning, even if we're not, you know, married to someone like your wife. Uh, there is hope no matter what we've gone through. Harriet Tubman's story is so inspiring. And I learned a lot just by watching the testimonies today. Absolutely. And what I have learned in life is really that joy is a choice. I think happiness can be a feeling, but God gives us the ability to choose joy no matter what. And one person who really That's understands right. that is actually Pat Robertson. And in his book, I Have Walked with the Living God, you can read about he how he discovered joy, even through some real adversity and struggle and challenge. And so we would love to give this to you as a gift. If, if you'd be willing to be a partner with us monthly at $20 a month to help us continue to spread joy across this great nation, we'd love to put this book into your hands. And so please call us at 1-855-759-0700 and become a partner today. And if you need prayer with anything, that is also your opportunity. We'd love to pray with you. Yeah, we've got some comments from some of our partners, Bill. Joan says, I thank the Lord for your ministry. I'm so blessed to be part of your ministry. Thanking God for an amazing 2021 for your ministry. Thank you, Joan. That really deeply encourages us. And Mary said, thank you for being such a blessing to countless numbers of people, to the glory of our Lord and Savior. And Mary, you're right. All of it is because of God's joy, God's transforming, life-saving message. And so thank you for sending that along as well. Well, you're right, Bill. Just that good reminder that joy is a choice. In the middle of our difficulty and struggle, this is actually the truth of the gospel. You can have joy in the middle of sorrow. You can have joy in the middle of struggle and difficulty. So that is the privilege we have as, as followers of Jesus. And I love Psalm 30, verse 5. It says, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Take it away, Bill. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And so may you experience God's amazing joy. Choose it today because it will transform you. Go in his strength and in his power. Be filled with his joy. Have a great day. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.